So for this lecture that I'm going to be recording, we're going to finish talking about structures in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And specifically, this video is going to cover the external components, including the cell wall and also the cell membrane. And so we're going to start by talking about the bacterial cell wall. The cell wall is going to be just outside the cell membrane. And the function of the cell wall is to prevent what's called osmotic lysis, meaning that to prevent if water goes into the bacterial cell, to prevent the bacteria from lysing or breaking open. And so we'll get to that topic in just another minute. The other function of the cell wall is that it's there to help protect the cell membrane. And remember that when we looked at bacteria, most bacterial cell walls are made primarily of peptidoglycan. Again, peptido refers to protein, glycan refers to sugar. And so you're going to see when we look at the peptidoglycan that it's a mixture of these sugars and these proteins put together. And so the cell wall often contributes to the pathogenicity, which is basically the ability for the bacteria to cause disease. And so if we look at peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan is a polymer of a disaccharide. So meaning that it's this disaccharide, di means two sugars put, put together, and they're going to be repeating over and over again in the peptidoglycan. And if we look at the peptidoglycan, the disaccharide is made of what's called NAG and NAM. And so this is the sugar for NAG. This is the sugar for NAM. And so I'm not going to ask you what NAG and NAM stand for, okay? But if you wanted to look at it, it's N-acetylglucosamine. And then NAM would be the N-acetylmuramic acid. And so when we look at these peptidoglycan, the disaccharide that's used is NAG and NAM bound together. So now elaborating on the fact that the peptidoglycan is NAG and NAM, in addition, we need to look at the overall structure. And so when we look at this, notice we have alternating NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM. And so we get these rows or these backbones of carbohydrates. This backbone of carbohydrates, um, those are going to be typically about 10 to 65 sugars long for the carbohydrate backbone and Running perpendicular to those carbohydrate backbones are the protein part of this. And so again, remember that when we look at peptidoglycan, peptido refers to protein, glycan is going to be the sugar. And so when we look at the amino acids that are used, they have these peptide cross bridges. And so what you'll see is you'll see that it's these amino acids and these amino acids link the peptidoglycan, the sugars, together. And so the amino acids attach to the NAM. So amino acids attach to NAM. And those amino acids are alternating D and L amino acids. And so remember that in nature, most amino acids exist in nature as L amino acids. But in this case, we're actually looking at the isomers, and they're going to alternate between the D and the L form of those amino acids. And so again, our rows of carbohydrates are linked together by polypeptides. 
So now we're going to compare and contrast gram-positive and gram-negative bacterial cell walls. And so if you remember back to lab where we looked at the cell walls for the gram stain, gram-positives, remember, have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. And in that peptidoglycan, there's what's called tachoic acids. And these tachoic acids are going to consist of an alcohol and a phosphate. And the tachoic acids are negatively charged. And what that's used for is it helps to bind and regulate the movement of cations, meaning positively charged ions, into and out of the cell. And when we look at tachoic acids, there are two main categories. There are the lipotachoic acids, Lipo refers to lipids. And if you look, here are the lipotachoic acids, and those actually help to link the cell wall into the cell membrane, meaning that these types of tachoic acid can actually embed themselves in the lipid in the cell membrane. There are also what are called wall tachoic acids. And so if you look, here are the wall tachoic acids, and notice that they're not embedded in the cell membrane. Instead, the wall tachoic acids are used to link those uh, peptidoglycan layers together. In addition, the um, tachoic acids can be antigenic. And remember that when we looked at flagella, for example, flagella have an H antigen, which can be useful in identifying the bacteria. Same thing for the tachoic acids is that these have these antigens which are these molecules that can be regulated or identified by the immune system. And using those antigens on the tachoic acid, it can help us to identify the bacteria in certain lab tests. So when we look at gram-negative bacteria, remember that for gram-negative bacteria, it has a very thin layer of peptidoglycan, but it has an outer membrane. And so when we look at the structure of the gram-negative cell walls, they don't have tachoic acids. And so they lack the tachoic acids because they have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. The space that's in between the two membranes that's called the periplasmic space. And so the periplasmic space is gonna be between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And in the case of gram negatives, it has the peptidoglycan. When we look at the outer membrane of the um, gram negative organisms, the outer membrane has three parts. And these three parts collectively are called LPS or lipopolysaccharides. And so when we look at these, the LPS has an O polysaccharide, a core polysaccharide, and lipid A. And so in a minute, we'll talk more about what these LPS are used for. In addition, they also have phospholipids. So again, they're those phospholipid bilayer. And they have these lipoproteins, which help to hold the outer membrane to the periplasmic space. And again, one of the things that's going to be different from gram-positive versus gram-negative is that for gram-negative cell walls, no tachoic acid. So they have an outer membrane, they have thin peptidoglycan, and they don't use tachoic acids in their cell wall. So if we look at the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, this has several functions. One is that this outer membrane helps to protect from phagocytosis. Remember, that means that that is when the white blood cells engulf the bacteria and take them in and destroy them. And so this membrane makes it harder for the immune system to do phagocytosis which then also then means it's harder for the body to eliminate that bacteria. It also helps to protect gram-negative organisms from something called complement. 
and complement you're going to learn about when we talk about immunology. But these are basically blood defense proteins, proteins that the immune system produces in response to some type of infection. And so this, the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria helps prevent against complement, meaning again, it helps it to survive. In addition, outer membrane is also used to um, protect the bacteria from antibiotics. And one of the ways through which they can do that is embedded in this membrane are these porins. And these porins are these channels through the membrane. And these proteins, these porins, are selectively permeable. And so what that means is that these porins and regulate what goes into and out of the cell. And so as a result, sometimes the porins get mutations through which antibiotics no longer can get into the gram-negative cell. And so having this outer membrane helps gram-negative bacteria to be typically more resistant to antibiotics. The outer membrane is also protective against digestive enzymes detergents, et cetera. And so you're going to see that this is really important when we talk about why gram-negative organisms are so important. So if we look now at more detail of the outer cell membrane, we're going to focus more now on looking at in the outer membrane so again, here's our outer membrane. Notice here's our per periplasmic space. Again, it's the space between the cell membrane and the outer membrane. We have our thin layer of peptidoglycan. We have those lipoproteins that link the peptidoglycan into those membranes. And then now we're going to focus on talking about the lipopolysaccharides, the LPS. And so if we look at a bigger diagram of the LPS, again, the parts of the LPS is going to be what's called an O polysaccharide. And so if we look, this is an LPS blown up. Here is the O polysaccharide. And the O polysaccharide at the top, so this would be up here, the O polysaccharide. The O polysaccharide is the antigen. Again, it's what allows to um, recognize and to determine a particular type of bacteria, meaning it's useful for distinguishing between different species. And so remember when I talked about E. coli, E. coli is a type of bacteria found in your gut. And remember we said that normal strains of E. coli don't cause food poisoning. The strains of E. coli that typically are responsible for food poisoning is the E. coli O157H7. And we said H7, that's for the flagellar antigen. The O157 is for the antigen that's found on the LPS in the outer membrane. And again, these antigens are useful for identifying a particular type of bacteria. We also have this core polysaccharide. So again, poly meaning many sugars. So these are these sugars linked together. And the core polysaccharide is there to provide stability. It's there for structural purposes. And then lastly, we have our lipid A. And the lipid A helps the LPS to embed in the cell membrane. And lipid A also has what's called an endotoxin. And an endotoxin is basically going to be a toxin that the bacteria produce. And when they produce this endo endotoxin, it causes fever, blood vessel damage, 
Um, blood pressure goes down. So you start to lose blood out of the leaky blood vessels. Um, that can lead to inappropriate blood clotting, heart rate goes up, and then shock. And if left untreated, this can prove to be fatal. And so for the gram-negative organisms, remember that we said that one of the main reasons that a physician would order a gram stain is because determining the gram reaction of the infection is extremely important. Remember we said that that's for two reasons. One being that if you look at um, the differences between gram positives and gram negatives, some antibiotics like penicillin, for example, penicillin inhibits peptidoglycan. Gram positives have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. Gram negatives have a thin layer. So penicillin is specific towards gram-positive organisms. So if your patient had a gram-negative infection, giving them penicillin won't be useful to treat that infection. But the other important reason about knowing the gram reaction is remember that I mentioned that if, you, if your patient has a gram-negative infection, you don't want to prescribe an antibiotic that's going to cause the bacterial cells to rupture. That's called uh, bactericidal. Cidal means kill. You don't want to prescribe a drug that's going to kill the gram-negative organism, which would rupture the cell, and it would release all that lipid A, which could lead to shock. So if your patient had a gram-negative infection, you would instead want to prescribe a drug that is what we call bacteriostatic. Static means stays the same. And for bacteriostatic antibiotics, those antibiotics simply inhibit the bacteria from growing and they give the immune system time to catch up. And so again, knowing the type of infection that a patient has can be really important for trying to decide what antibiotic to prescribe to that patient. So this slide is just comparing gram positives and gram negatives. So again, gram positives have a thick peptidoglycan. Again, it's about eight times thicker typically than um, gram negatives. Gram positives have the tachoic acids in their cell wall. Gram negatives have a thin peptidoglycan. They lack tachoic acids. They have an outer membrane. So again, if we look at this outer membrane, right, we have our cell membrane, we have the outer membrane, and we have this periplasmic space, the space that exists between the outer membrane and the cell membrane. And so this is looking at comparing gram positives and gram negatives. And so in your question set, there's um, a question about to diagram what the cell walls look like for gram positive versus gram negative. And so these examples down here would be like what you'd want to draw. So you would draw gram positives have a thick peptidoglycan. They have the lipotachoic acids. Again, those are the ones that link the peptidoglycan to the cell membrane. They have wall tachoic acids, which help to hold them together, but they don't go into um, the cell membrane of the gram-negative organism. Again, when we look at gram-positives, you would want the cell membrane. You would want the periplasmic space you would want to label a thin layer of peptidoglycan, periplasmic space again, and then the outer membrane. And so when we look at the outer membrane, it has those porins or the channels, which regulate what goes into and out for a gram-negative organism. And it has those lipopolysaccharides, the LPS, and those have those three parts. 
the O polysaccharide being at the top, the core polysaccharide being here, and then the lipid A is the part that's embedded in the membrane. So this is just another diagram showing you again, comparing gram positives and gram negatives. And so these are an elect electron micrograph and these have been artificially colored. So these colors that you're seeing on this image don't actually exist when these pictures were taken. But what these are, what these are doing is that the yellow is where they've labeled the cell membrane. And so remember that all cells have a cell membrane. So in this case, here's our cell membrane. Here's our cell membrane for our gram positives and our gram negatives. If we look at the peptidoglycan, the peptidoglycan has been colored um, brown. Notice that the peptidoglycan is much thicker in the gram positives than it is in the gram negatives. And again, gram positives have a much thicker peptidoglycan when compared to gram negatives. However, gram negatives have this additional outer membrane and notice that it's lacking for the gram positives. The other thing to point out is that notice that when we look over here, notice you see this area that's in between the peptidoglycan and the outer membrane that's the periplasmic space. And over here, that's the periplasmic space. It's the space between the peptidoglycan and the membrane. Over here, notice there seems to be a little gap here, but it's typically not thought of as gram positives having a periplasmic space, that perhaps this little gap that you're seeing there is simply due to an artifact that occurred during this procedure. Um, and so typically when we think of gram positives and gram negatives, gram negatives have that periplasmic space because they have the cell membrane and the outer membrane. Gram positives on the other hand, have the cell membrane and then they have the thick layer of peptidoglycan. So, Remember in lab, we talked about the gram stain. And the gram stain, remember, is a differential stain which allows us to um, differentiate bacteria based on their differences in their peptidoglycan. And so remember, we're gonna look at this again, but gram stain has the four steps. And in the first step, we use the crystal violet. And the crystal violet and so let's go ahead and put the pen back on. And so for gram negative, or I'm sorry, for gram positive bacteria, gram positive bacteria, because they have the thick peptidoglycan, they're going to retain the crystal violet and they're going to stain purple. So here, these are our gram positive bacteria. For gram negative bacteria, because they have a thin peptidoglycan, when we go to decolorize, the decolorizer is going to shrink that very small layer of peptidoglycan, and the dye, the, the, the crystal violet, is going to come out of the gram negative cells. And so we're going to say gram negative cells lose crystal violet and they stain pink because of safranin and safranin is going to be our counter stain and so we're going to walk through again the steps in the gram stain so when we look at the four steps of the gram stain procedure remember that the first step is going to be the crystal violet step and the crystal violet is our primary stain and crystal violet is going to be a basic stain which remember means that the stain is positively charged and it's attracted to the negatively charged cell 
And so remember that when we look at gram positives and gram negatives, the positive and negatives have nothing to do with the charge of the bacteria. In both cases, these bacteria are negatively charged. The only difference between gram positives and gram negatives is again the thickness of the peptidoglycan. And so gram positives and gram negatives are both negatively charged cells. And so we use a basic stain, which has a positive charge. And that basic stain, that crystal violet, is going to be used to stain both gram positives and gram negatives. And so notice at this point in the staining procedure, both are going to be purple. Then we add the iodine. And the iodine, remember, is our mordant. And what this does is it creates a crystal violet iodine complex. And what that does is it makes those crystal violet molecules larger to basically help to keep the crystal violet into the cells. At this point, both gram positives and gram negatives are both purple. Then we add our decolorizer, and our decolorizer is going to be our alcohol acetone. And remember that this is the most important step. in the entire procedure. And that's because this is where we get our differential stain. If we time this just right, what happens is, is as we run the decolorizer over the cells or over the slide, gram positives have that thick peptidoglycan. Gram negatives have the outer membrane and a thin peptidoglycan. And so as we add the decolorizer, because this membrane is lipids, it's going to dissolve. And because it has a thin peptidoglycan, that peptidoglycan is going to shrink. And because it's so much thinner, the dye molecules are going to go out of the gram negative and leave the cell. If we do this properly, gram positive cells are going to retain the crystal violet. And that's because they have a much thicker layer of peptidoglycan. So again, you have to time that just right in order for gram negative to be clear and gram positives to be purple. Then after we do the decolorizer step, then we're going to use our safranin. And safranin is our secondary stain or our counter stain. And remember that that step is important because that allows us to stain the now colorless gram-negative bacteria. In terms of gram-positives, remember that when we add safranin, safranin is also a basic stain, meaning that it is attracted to the negatively charged cell. So for gram-positives, the safranin still gets in, but the purple dye, which is the crystal violet, is darker, and those cells appear purple. When we look at the gram-negative bacteria, which lost the crystal violet because of their thinner peptidoglycan, when we now add the safranin, or our counter stain, now the red dye stains the colorless cells, and it allows us to be able to see the gram-negative cells. And so notice that when the staining procedure is done, Gram positive cells are going to be purple. Gram negative cells are going to be reddish pink. And so this again is a differential stain. It allows us to differentiate between closely related bacteria. So we just finished looking at gram staining. And remember that we said that for gram, gram positive or gram negative bacteria, that most bacteria fall into one of those two categories. About 95% of bacteria are considered to be either gram positive or to be gram negative. Now, there are some bacteria that we call gram variable. And what that means is that depending on when you look at the gram stain for that particular culture, sometimes it might appear being gram positive, other times it might appear being gram negative. An example of this would be for Bacillus and Clostridium.
And so think about when you think about Bacillus and Clostridium, what structure do those two bacteria both produce, which they have in common? And the answer is, is that they both produce endospores. Now, typically when we think of Bacillus and Clostridium, we would call those gram-positive organisms. However, if the cultures age, meaning if they've been growing in culture for long periods of times, they can start showing increasing numbers of gram-negative cells, meaning that for that organism, depending on when you gram-stain it, sometimes it might appear gram-positive, other times it might appear gram-negative. And so now we're going to look at atypical cell walls, so other types of cell walls that fall out of this gram-positive or gram-negative. And so the first one that we'll look at is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Remember that this is going to be an example of an acid fast bacterium. And what that means is that their composition for their cell wall is atypical. And what that means is that in the case of mycobacterium, their cell wall is made of 60% mycolic acid. So they still have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, but outside of that peptidoglycan, they have that mycolic acid. And the mycolic acid is held together by a polysaccharide, so meaning multiple sugars put together. And so when we look at mycolic acid, remember that that type of cell wall is very waxy and very sticky. And so, one of the advantages to the bacteria for having mycolic acid is that the bacteria is very resistant to chemicals. So it's more difficult to treat with antibiotics. It's harder to clean using disinfectants. They're much more resistant to chemicals. In addition, they are also resistant to dehydration. Remember that I said that if you look at bacteria, most bacteria on a surface can only survive two to three days. When we look at mycobacteria, they're longer lived. They can survive on surfaces for up to six months. And so that bacteria is very resistant to dehydration. In addition, it's also resistant to phagocytic digestion, meaning that in your lungs, your lungs have these types of white blood cells that are called alveoli macrophages. And macrophages are cells that can do phagocytosis, meaning they can send out those extensions, take in the bacteria, and normally those macrophages would then destroy that bacteria. But because mycobacterium has mycolic acid in their cell wall, what ends up happening is the macrophages can't digest the bacteria. They were able to take them in, but they can't break it down. And so what you get is these tubercules or these scar tissues that form in the lungs and the patients can actually start coughing up blood as a result. Only about 2% of patients get full-blown tuberculosis. HIV patients are more likely to die from this. This is one of the biggest killers in the world um, for HIV deaths, meaning that oftentimes HIV can lead to a compromised immune system, and then patients can actually die of a secondary infection because their immune system couldn't fight off, for example, this mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so um, this, these bacteria are resistant to phagocytic digestion. And again, they're also going to be resistant to chemicals. The next one that we're going to look at is going to be mycoplasma pneumoniae. And this causes primary atypical sorry, atypical um, walking. Pneumonia. 
And so if you've ever heard this term, walking pneumonia, this is basically where you get an infection in your lungs, but it's a less severe type of pneumonia, meaning walking, you might be able to still function and carry on, yet have this infection in your lungs. And so most, um, most pneumonia is actually caused by streptococcus pneumoniae, um, but a lot of lung infections are typically viral. And when you get a viral lung infection, sometimes you can then get a secondary infection from bacteria. And so when a patient has this mycoplasma pneumoniae in their lungs, and let's say the doctor decided to gram stain to try and determine what type of bacteria might be in the lungs, it's often missed by a gram stain. And the reason for that is that what makes mycoplasma unique is that they lack, so they lack a cell wall. They are one of the smallest bacterial cells. So they're about 0.2 micrometers, which if you remember like E. coli, for example, is about one micrometer. These are one fifth of that. So they're even smaller than um, most normal bacteria. And in fact, one of the reasons that it took so long for scientists to discover them is because they're so small. Originally, when they were discovered, they were mistaken for being a virus, but they're not. They're actually a bacteria. Because they lack a cell wall, they are pleomorphic, meaning they can take on um, multiple shapes. And one of the problems with not having a cell wall is that this bacteria is sensitive to dehydration and hypotonic environments. And so what I mean by hypotonic environments, we're going to talk more about this in a minute, but hypotonic means that the solution outside the cell has a lower solute concentration. Remember, solutes are things that can be dissolved. And so if you have a lot of water outside the cell relative to inside, what ends up happening is water will go into the cell. Now, bacterial cells, plant cells that have a cell wall, the cell wall can help restrain how much water can get into um, the bacteria. In the case of mycoplasma, because they lack a cell wall, they are more sensitive to damage from water rushing in than other types of bacteria. What ends up happening is that if too much water goes in, the cells undergo lysis, meaning that they break open. And so to help to try and combat this defect by not having a cell wall, they actually have these sterols in the cell membrane. And the sterols are typically so sterols, are cholesterol-like. meaning they're lipids. And you're gonna see in a minute that one of the functions of cholesterol in the cell membrane is to help to maintain the correct fluidity. And so because these bacteria lack a cell wall, those sterols, which are typically only found in eukaryotic cells, these sterols are present in these cells to help to protect from this lysis to protect from the bacteria rupturing and breaking up. Now, one of the problems with treating mycoplasma is that they can be difficult to treat with antibiotics because they lack a cell wall. And so if you think about penicillin, for example, penicillin is an antibiotic you're gonna see that targets 
peptidoglycan synthesis or cell wall synthesis. If, peptide, if, if mycoplasma lacks a cell wall, they don't have peptidoglycan, meaning that penicillin would not be effective against them. And so these are more difficult to treat because we don't have as many antibiotics that could be used to target this type of bacteria. And so the last little part for this part is going to be to look at what are some of the things that can damage cell walls. And so the first is going to be an enzyme called lysozyme. And lysozyme is an enzyme normally found in perspiration or sweat, um, in tears, mucus, and saliva. And your body produces the lysozyme as a defense mechanism. It's there to help inhibit microbial growth. And what it does is that it actually breaks down or it digests the disaccharides in the peptidoglycan. And so because they break down that peptidoglycan that causes damage to the cells, and when the cells get damaged, they might die um, as a result. Another example of a chemical that damages cell walls is going to be penicillin. Penicillin, again, is an antibiotic, and the way that it works is that it inhibits those peptide bridges in the peptidoglycan. And so again, notice that both of these inhibit peptidoglycan. So what type of bacteria do you think might be affected most by lysozyme and penicillin? Is it gonna be the gram positives or the gram negatives? And so think for a minute. And so you would come to the conclusion that these usually affect gram positive more. And that's because gram positives have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And so because they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan, um, they are more sensitive to these chemicals. However, most of the organisms in your mouth are typically gram positive. For example, if you happen to carry Streptococcus pyogenes, that's the one that carries that causes strep throat. Streptococcus pyogenes is a gram positive bacteria, yet they have acquired adaptations that actually allow them to survive even in the presence of lysozyme. And so they found a way basically to resist lysozyme. But again, typically lysozyme is going to inhibit peptidoglycan, which means that typically both of these chemicals are more going to affect gram positives relative to gram negatives. So I have a question for you. And the question says, the outer membrane of gram negative bacteria contains red sterols, yellow mycolic acid, green tachoic acid, or blue lipopolysaccharide. So I want you to pause, think about your answer, and then when you're ready, go ahead and turn the video back on. Okay, so if you said blue, you're correct. Right, so gram negative bacteria in the outer membrane have the lipopolysaccharide. So let's think about what bacteria have these other ones. So when we look at sterols, sterols again are found in mycoplasma. And that's because mycoplasma lacks a cell wall. And so to balance that, they have the sterols or these cholesterols in their cell membrane. Mycolic acid, which bacteria have mycolic acid? That's gonna be our mycobacterium. Mycobacterium. 
for our tachoic acids, our tachoic acids, remember, are going to be found in gram positive only. So gram negatives lack tachoic acid, gram positives have them. And so again, in the outer membrane, this is going to be the LPS, the lipopolysaccharides. So now we're going to move on and talk about the cell membrane. And so now we're going to move from cell wall in. And so if we look at bacteria, for example, right, this is going to be an example of gram negative bacteria. Notice they have the outer membrane, they have peptidoglycan, and then now we come inside to the cell membrane. And so when we look at the cell membrane, the cell membrane is what we call the fluid mosaic model. And what that means is when we call the cell membrane a fluid mosaic, that means that the membrane is a fluid structure, meaning that it's not really rigid, it's more kind of liquidy and fluid. And the mosaic part of this is that for the cell membrane, um, it has these mosaic or these different types of proteins embedded in the membrane. And those proteins do a variety of things that you're gonna see in a minute. If we look at a typical erythrocyte or red blood cell, the erythrocyte has about 50 different types of proteins embedded in the membrane, and that's only one cell type. And so cells can have lots and lots of different proteins embedded in the membrane. In addition, one of the main components of the cell membrane, remember, is our phospholipid bilayer. And our phospholipid bilayer, remember, is Amphipathic. It has a hydrophilic head. So here's our hydrophilic head. And it has this hydrophobic tail. Hydrophobic means water fearing. So notice that the tail is primarily hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are nonpolar, which means they don't have any charge to interact with water. And so if you see, this is how typically you'll see phospholipid simplified. So here's the head and the two tails. And so what happens is, is these phospholipids self-orient themselves so that the heads face outside the cell and the heads face inside the cell where water is available. And the tails orient themselves in the middle and that's to shield them away from the water. And so you get this phospholipid bilayer these two layers of phospholipids, heads face outside and inside the cell, and the tails are shielded in the middle. Now, what is the function of the cell membrane? Well, if you think about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, remember that we said that prokaryotic cells typically lack membrane-bound organelles, meaning that they lack mitochondria. Mitochondria is a membrane-bound organelle that allows eukaryotic cells to carry out cellular respiration, break down glucose, convert it into ATP chemical energy. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria don't have that membrane-bound organelle. And you're going to see that part of cellular respiration takes place embedded in the membrane of the mitochondria. Because bacteria lack that mitochondria, it doesn't mean that they can't do cellular respiration. They can, they're still able to take chemical energy and convert it into ATP, but to do so, they actually synthesize ATP in their cell membrane. And that's unique. Eukaryotic cells do not. Eukaryotic cells make ATP in mitochondria. Prokaryotic cells make their ATP embedded in the membrane of the bacterial cell. And so that is one of the things that has to happen in bacteria. In addition, we also get nutrient processing, meaning 
the membrane is going to be selectively permeable. It's going to regulate what goes into and out of the cell, meaning we don't want anything and everything to come in and out, but we also don't want nothing to come in and out. And so the membrane is going to be used to transport things like glucose, for example, into and out of the cell. And it also allows the bacteria to process those nutrients to basically um, a lot of times there's enzymes that help break down those nutrients. And so when we look at prokaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells typically are going to lack sterols or they lack the cholesterol in the membrane that eukaryotic cells will have. And you'll see why that's important in a little bit. So this is just showing you the fluid mosaic model. And again, what that means is that the membrane is a fluid structure and the membrane is about as viscous as olive oil. So again, you don't want it to be too solid. Another example of a lipid that's solid would be butter, right? You wouldn't want your membrane to be like butter so that nothing could get in and out. You also don't want the membrane to be so fluid that it can't regulate what goes into and out. And so when we look at this phospholipid bilayer, there's no covalent bonds holding those phospholipids together. What's holding these phospholipids together are actually the hydrophobic interactions between the tails. And that interaction is what's going to keep the membrane to be fluid. Because again, if there were covalent bonds holding those together, that's a rather rigid bond. But because it's just hydrophobic interactions, those are weak interactions, and the phospholipids actually move side to side very freely. Occasionally, they can rotate from one phospholipid leaflet to the other, but that's a lot less likely. They can, though, go side to side, and that's because they are this fluid structure. And then there are proteins which you're going to see in a minute, do a variety of things inside the bacteria. So the cell membrane has four main components, a phospholipid bilayer, cholesterol, proteins, and something called glycocalyx. And so we're going to talk about what do each of those four components do. And if you recall back to our lecture on macromolecules, we talked about phospholipids. And remember that phospholipids are amphipathic, meaning that they have both a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion. And if you remember, hydro is referring to water. And if you think of a phobia, a phobia is a fear, right? If I'm arachnophobic, I'm afraid of spiders. And so the hydrophilic heads, and for those, those are gonna face both inside the cell and outside the cell where water is present. The middle part of the membrane are made up of these fatty acid tails, and the fatty acid tails, remember, are hydrophobic. They're water-fearing. And so they're actually shielded from the water that's both inside the cell and outside the cell. And so the main component of the membrane is going to be this phospholipid bilayer. And this is really important because the membrane is a very fluid structure. And so the phospholipids themselves also help to maintain the correct fluidity. Another component for the fluidity of the membrane is the cholesterol. And when we think of cholesterol, we typically have a negative connotation in our head, right? You think of, oh, I need to make sure my cholesterol is not too high. But in fact, your cells actually require cholesterol in order to function. And so cholesterol, in some instances, is actually a good thing. And the cholesterol in the membrane is there to basically keep the correct fluidity, meaning that it prevents the membrane from packing in too tightly and making a very solid structure. And it also prevents the membrane from becoming too fluid in which it couldn't regulate what goes into or out of the cell. And so cholesterol is very important in keeping the cell membrane the correct fluidity. The next component are going to be the proteins. And for the proteins, we're going to talk about the functions in a minute. Um, proteins have a variety of functions in a cell. 
if you think of an erythrocyte, which is red blood cells, um, erythrocytes have about 50 different types of proteins embedded in the membrane. Some of these proteins are what we call integral proteins, meaning that they're actually embedded in the membrane. And some of these proteins are gonna be peripheral proteins, which are just associated with the membrane. The next and last component is gonna be the glycocalyx. And these are basically gonna be sugars that attach to proteins or phospholipids, and they serve as binding sites and as cell lubrication and adhesion molecules. They basically are there to help also with cell-cell recognition, meaning that two cells can recognize one another. So when we look at the cell membrane and we compare between prokaryotic and eukaryotic membranes, there are several things that they have in common. And the first is that primarily they're both made of a phospholipid bilayer. And so we talked about the phospholipids when we looked at our lecture on macromolecules. And in this case for the membrane, it's gonna be primarily the phospholipid bilayer. In addition, there are the integral and the peripheral proteins, which we just talked about, that do a variety of different things inside the cell. Now, in addition to similarities, there are also differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell membranes. For example, remember when we talked about cell walls and we talked about that there's a type of bacteria that lacks a cell wall. And so think for a minute, which of the bacteria that we talked about lacks a cell wall? And the answer is going to be mycoplasma. And so for mycoplasma, because they lack that cell wall, they also have the sterols or the cholesterol embedded in the membrane to help keep the correct fluidity. Most eukaryotic organisms like animals use cholesterol as their sterols. For fungi, the sterol in the media or in the membrane is a little bit different. It's something called ergosterol. And so sterols are typically unique to eukaryotic cells except in the case of mycoplasma. In addition, for eukaryotic cells, they often use carbohydrates embedded in the membrane that are used for both attachment and for cell-cell recognition, like we saw for the glycocalyx. So the cell membrane has four main components, a phospholipid bilayer, cholesterol, proteins, and something called glycocalyx. And so we're gonna talk about what do each of those four components do. And if you recall back to our lecture on macromolecules, we talked about phospholipids. And remember that phospholipids are amphipathic, meaning that they have both a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion. And if you remember, hydro is referring to water. And if you think of a phobia, a phobia is a fear, right? If I'm arachnophobic, I'm afraid of spiders. And so the hydrophilic heads, and for those, those are gonna face both inside the cell and outside the cell where water is present. The middle part of the membrane are made up of these fatty acid tails, and the fatty acid tails, remember, are hydrophobic. They're water-fearing. And so they're actually shielded from the water that's both inside the cell and outside the cell. And so the main component of the membrane is gonna be this phospholipid bilayer. And this is really important because the membrane is a very fluid structure. And so the phospholipids themselves also help to maintain the correct fluidity. Another component for the fluidity of the membrane is the cholesterol. And when we think of cholesterol, we typically have a negative connotation in our head, right? You think of, oh, I need to make sure my cholesterol is not too high. But in fact, your cells actually require cholesterol in order to function. And so cholesterol, in some instances, is actually a good thing. And the cholesterol in the membrane is there to basically keep the correct fluidity, meaning that it prevents the membrane from packing in too tightly and making a very solid structure. And it also prevents the membrane from becoming too fluid in which it couldn't regulate what goes into or out of the cell. And so cholesterol is very important in keeping the cell membrane the correct fluidity.
The next component are going to be the proteins. And for the proteins, we're going to talk about the functions in a minute. Um, proteins have a variety of functions in a cell. If you think of an erythrocyte, which is a red blood cells, um, erythrocytes have about 50 different types of proteins embedded in the membrane. Some of these proteins are what we call integral proteins, meaning that they're actually embedded in the membrane. And some of these proteins are going to be peripheral proteins, which are just associated with the membrane. The next and last component is going to be the glycocalyx. And these are basically going to be sugars that attach to proteins or phospholipids. And they serve as binding sites and as cell lubrication and adhesion molecules. They basically are there to help also with cell-cell recognition, meaning that two cells can recognize one another. So we're going to talk for a minute about what do those proteins do in the membrane. And remember that I said that if we look at an erythrocyte, which is a red blood cell, a red blood cell has 50 different types of proteins. And so you can probably imagine that if it has that many different types of proteins, that they probably do very diverse things in the cell. And so one of the things that proteins do in the membrane is for transport. These are going to allow substances to flow through these hydrophilic channels. Some things can cross the membrane on their own to get into and out of the cell. Others need a little bit of help. And so that help is through these proteins. And we're going to talk about these more um, later in the lecture. Another function is going to be for enzymatic activity. And these basically are enzymes that are going to speed up chemical reactions. They help chemical reactions to go faster. And again, at the end of this lecture, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what enzymes are and how they function. Another really important component um, of proteins in the membrane is that some of these proteins act as what are called signal transduction pathways. And basically what that means is that these receptors have what's called a ligand. And a ligand is a signaling molecule. And the ligand and the receptors are very, very specific. And when a ligand comes in and it signals and it binds to the receptor, that initiates some sort of signal transduction pathway inside the cell that tells the cell what to do. For example, if you got a cut and you had a wound, you probably know that that wound is not going to stay there forever. Eventually that wound is going to heal. And one of the things that's going to happen is the cells in the area of the wound are going to send growth factors to the cells in the area, telling them to divide to repair the damaged tissue. And so these growth factors get sent and the growth factors themselves are going to be the ligand and cells have receptors for those growth factors. And that then sends a signal to tell that cell to divide. And so these are called signal transduction pathways. They're basically a way to relay a signal to allow cells to communicate with each other. Another important function of a membrane is cell cell recognition. And this basically is going to serve as identification tags recognized by other cells. So if you remember in our cell lecture where we looked at the video of the uh, white blood cell chasing the bacteria, you'll remember that the white blood cell didn't engulf the red blood cells. It recognized that those cells were self and that not to engulf its own red blood cells. However, it did recognize a signaling molecule on the bacteria and when it came to the bacteria, you'll remember that it engulfed and it took in that bacteria. And so there are these proteins, typically glycoproteins, that help with cell-cell recognition. The next is going to be for intercellular joining. So allowing two cells to join together and kind of holding them together. And then lastly, um, attachment to the cytoskeleton and what's called the extracellular matrix. And this is basically there to help maintain cell shape and to coordinate changes to the cell shape. And so this is going to be important for uh, maintaining cell shape. And so we're going to talk about now traffic across the membrane.
how do we get molecules into or out of the cell? And traffic across the membrane is essential. You have to be able to get things into and out of the cell in order for the cell to survive. And if you think about it, for example, think of your own cells. If you don't eat, your cells can't survive. Your cells need to be able to take in molecules for energy. We're not plants. We can't make our own energy. And so the way that we get our energy is by eating food, right? And so our cells need to be able to take in those sugars and take in those amino acids and take in all the other um, essential nutrients that our cell needs to survive. And so obviously then cells need to be able to take in different molecules for energy. They also need to be able to get rid of metabolic waste products, so things that the cell no longer needs. If you think of breathing, for example, right? You breathe in oxygen and you exhale carbon dioxide. And you're going to see later that the reason for this gas exchange is for cellular respiration. And carbon dioxide is going to be a waste product of cellular respiration and the cells need to be able to get rid of it and the cells will have the carbon dioxide leave. It'll go through the bloodstream to the lungs and you exhale it out. Additionally, cells need to be able to take in and expel many important ions. Sodium and potassium, for example. So if you look at this image here, here are the sodium and potassium channels. And neurons, which are the nervous system cells that communicate with one another, the way that neurons fire is simply through a change in the distribution of ions. And the way that these ions move is through these sodium or potassium channels. And all an, an action potential or a neuron firing really is, is a change in voltage, which is a result of a change in the ion distribution across the cell membrane. And so being able to move these ions um, is essential. If we think about calcium, right, you probably have been told when you were younger that you needed to drink, let's say, milk for calcium for your bones. So cells need to have calcium. Chloride. Chloride is an ion, and chloride, we'll talk about later, um, a disease that results from defective chloride ions is, or from defective chloride channels is going to be cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis causes these defective chloride channels. And we'll talk about later about how that affects the movement of water across the membrane. So when we look at the phospholipid bilayer, remember that the bilayer is made up primarily of phospholipids. And again, phospholipids are amphipathic, meaning they have these hydrophilic heads and these hydrophobic nonpolar tails. And so the way that the membrane orients itself, again, is that the heads, which are hydrophilic, want to interact with the water both outside the cell and inside the cell. And the tails that are hydrophobic want to be shielded from the water, and they're going to be in the middle. So when we look at this membrane, again, there's a part that's hydrophilic, and there's a portion that's hydrophobic. And this is going to basically have an effect on what types of things can cross or do not cross the cell membrane. So the things that can cross the membrane on their own are gonna be things that are hydrophobic. So hydrophobic and hydrophobic, oil and oil, can interact with one another. And so these hydrophobic molecules are gonna be able to get through this hydrophobic core and get into the cell freely. And so this is gonna be things like steroids. So think about um, testosterone, estrogen, which are steroid hormones. Those can cross the cell membrane on their own. Also, small hydrocarbons. Remember that carbon and hydrogen, similar electronegativities, and so when they bond, they're gonna form nonpolar covalent bonds, meaning they're gonna share the electrons equally and they're also going to be hydrophobic. And so small hydrocarbons can cross the membrane on their own. As well as nonpolar small molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen. Because again, if they're nonpolar, 
they're also going to be hydrophobic, which will allow them to be able to get through this hydrophobic core of the cell membrane. The things that cannot cross are things that are hydrophilic, and that's because hydrophilic molecules cannot interact with this hydrophobic core. So think of hydrophilic like water can't interact with oil, which is like this hydrophobic part. So a good rule of thumb is if something dissolves in water, it can't cross the membrane on its own. And so that includes things like salt, right? If you remember back to salt, salt is sodium chloride, and those are ions. And sodium is a positive ion, chloride is a negative ion. These are hydrophilic. They'll interact with water, and therefore they cannot get through this hydrophobic core, and these ions can't cross the membrane on their own. Another example, glucose, right? Think of sugar, for example. If you took sugar and you dissolved it in your coffee, it would dissolve. And that's because sugars are polar. And if they're polar, they're hydrophilic. And again, things that are hydrophilic cannot cross this hydrophobic interior of the membrane. Um, amino acids, which are, remember, the building blocks for proteins, those are also polar and therefore cannot cross this hydrophobic core. So the things that cannot cross, hydrophilic molecules, charged ions, or very large molecules, all of those components make it so they cannot cross the membrane on their own and they need help. So we're going to talk now about diffusion. And diffusion is the movement of molecules or ions from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. And so I want you to imagine for a minute that you have a beaker of water or a glass of water. If you take that glass of water and you put in drops of food coloring, for example, you'll notice that when you put that food coloring in, those drops of dye don't stay as drops forever. That dye is gonna to start to move and spread out. It's gonna go from its high concentration as a drop to the low concentration, which is the water around it, right? Because when you put the drop in, the high concentration is where you put it in, the low concentration is gonna be the water around it. And so those dye molecules are gonna move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And they'll continue to move and they'll continue to, to um, spread out until eventually they're evenly distributed in the, in the water. And at that point, we would say that they've reached equilibrium. Now, when we talk about things going from a high concentration to low, you'll hear the term going down the concentration gradient. And if you think about it, going from high concentration to low right, so that dye going from its high concentration to low, that's a favorable reaction. That will happen on its own. I don't have to do anything to make those dye molecules spread out. And so when we talk about a concentration gradient, there's two ways. Things can go up a concentration gradient or they can go down. And now think about which one is more favorable, which one's gonna happen spontaneously. Will things roll, let's say, down a hill or spontaneously, will they go up a hill? And you guys probably all know based on gravity that by default, without anything happening, things would go down a hill. That's a spontaneous process. Going down a hill doesn't require anything. Going up a hill, though, requires energy. And so diffusion, because we're going from higher to lower, and that's favorable, and that happens spontaneously, we say that that's moving these molecules down the concentration gradient. And again, this is a spontaneous process. No energy is required, but it is dependent on the thermal motion of molecules. Because remember that molecules have inherent movement. They bounce around. And if you think about what you learned back when you were a kid, if you heat something up, what happens to molecular motion? And if you think about it for a minute, you might recall that if you heat something up, molecules move faster. And so if those molecules are starting to move faster, do you think that diffusion is gonna happen faster at warmer temperatures 
or at cooler temperatures. And so think about that for a minute. Will it happen faster at warmer temperatures or at cooler temperatures? And you might come up with that it's gonna happen faster at warmer temperatures because at warmer temperatures, molecular motion's gonna speed up, which means that those molecules are gonna move faster and they're gonna evenly distribute at a faster rate. And so again, the molecules are gonna bounce around and eventually spread out until they reach equilibrium. And so here's a different example of this. Here on the left, we have this beaker and it has a membrane and this membrane is permeable to the dye, meaning that these molecules of dye can cross the membrane. And so if we put dye only on one side, these molecules of dye are gonna move from their higher concentration on the left to the lower concentration on the right. But notice that the dye molecules don't exclusively go to the right. Some of them by chance will happen to go back to the left. It's just that net movement, meaning uh, it's more going to be towards the right. And those molecules are gonna move towards the right until they evenly spread out, at which point we would say that they're at equilibrium. Now, when molecules reach equilibrium, does that mean they stop moving? And the answer is no. Molecules always move even at equilibrium. It's just that those molecules don't have net movement, meaning they're not going one way or the other faster in either direction. The movement to the right equals the movement to the left. And so that's an important concept is molecules always move even at equilibrium. So water also has thermal motion and it will also bounce around and work to spread out. And water will also move down the concentration gradient, meaning that it will go from its high concentration, so that's what these brackets represent, that refers to concentration. So it's gonna go from its high water concentration to its low water concentration. And so to understand how this works, we need to kind of review and talk about water. And so remember that water, H2O, is an oxygen covalently bound to two hydrogens. And if you remember back to our water lecture, you'll remember that water is polar, meaning that even though oxygen and hydrogen share electrons, they don't share equally. And that has to do again with electronegativity. And if you remember back to that lecture, and we talked about electronegativity, is oxygen or is hydrogen more electronegative? And so remember that we said that the atom that is going to have a greater electronegativity is going to be the one that has its outer shell more full. And so if you remember back to oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons in its second shell of electrons, which means that oxygen only needs two more to fill its outer shell. Hydrogen, on the other hand, has one electron in its first shell and it only needs one more to fill its outer shell. So hydrogen is only half full, whereas oxygen has six out of eight, meaning it's more than half full. And so if you think about oxygen and hydrogen, that then means that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And what that means is that because it's more electronegative, when they share electrons, they don't share equally. It's like a tug of war. Oxygen wants those electrons more. And so the electrons are gonna spend more time around the oxygen and less time around the hydrogen. And so as oxygen pulls harder for those electrons, oxygen gets a partial negative charge because electrons are negative. And if the negatively charged electrons spend more time around oxygen, it's a partial negative charge, which means then that the hydrogens get a partial positive charge. And that's because the electron spends more time with oxygen, which leaves hydrogens as just a proton, and the electron is spending more of the time around oxygen, so it's partially positive. And so what you get is water, again, is polar. It has a part that's 
partially negative, which is the oxygen, and a part that's partially positive, which is the hydrogens. Now, when we talked about solutes, remember that a solute is something that dissolves in water. So in this diagram, this diagram showing it as a sugar, but it just as easily could be something like uh, salt, right? You know that you can dissolve salt in water. So I'm gonna show you a diagram using salt as an example, because it's a little more simple. And if you remember back to our lecture talking about salt, salt, remember, is just simply sodium ions and chloride ions. And sodium ions are positively charged. Chloride ions are negatively charged. And so remember that when we talked about interactions between atoms, opposites attract. And so what's gonna happen is that negatively charged chloride ion is gonna be attracted to the partial positive hydrogens, and we get these hydration shells. Sodium, on the other hand, has a positive charge, and it's gonna interact with that partially negative oxygen. And so what happens is, is the reason that salt dissolves in water is because the water molecules interact with the sodium and the chloride, and they separate them from each other. So if on the left, you have a lower solute concentration, and on the right, you have a solute, higher solute concentration, that means that on the right side, where we have more sugar, we have less free water. And what I mean by this is, in this case, this membrane is selectively permeable. And what that means is that some things can cross the membrane, others cannot. And in this case, our solute is not able to get across the membrane. Only the water can move. And so we can't say that the solute is gonna move from the right to the left because it can't cross the membrane. So what we need to focus on is which direction the water will move. And so to think about which way the water will move, wherever we have a higher solute concentration, wherever that solute's present, water is gonna be attached to it. And if you remember, the solute can't cross the membrane. And so on this side where we have more, uh, more solutes, we have less free water because the water's not free to move, it's bound to the solute. On this left side here, we have a lower, lower concentration of solutes, but we have more free water, more water that's not bound to a solute that's free to move. And so we have more free water here, less free water here. And remember that things are gonna go always from high concentration to low. So it's gonna go from its high concentration of water here to low concentration of water here. And water is gonna move to the right and it's gonna start to fill up the tube on this side. And so again, just like all other molecules, water is also gonna move from a high concentration to low. And when you're looking for which way water moves, it's always gonna be from the low solute concentration, which is where you're gonna have more free water, to the high solute concentration, where you have less free water. So either way is fine to remember it if you wanna remember that it moves from low solute to high solute. But for me, I would rather remember that things always go from high to low. And so I always like to remember that it's gonna move from here, where it has more free water or a higher water concentration, to this side where it has a lower water concentration. And so this is gonna be referred to as osmosis. Okay, and osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now, tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or to lose water. And you always need to compare two solutions because water or a cell is only gonna gain or lose water depending on solute concentration. And in order for this to work, it must be separated by a water permeable membrane, meaning that water can move. Because how can a cell gain or lose water if water can't move? And you have to be really careful when you start talking about tonicity because you need to pay attention to which of the two solutions you're referring to. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. 
So the first one that we'll talk about is a hypertonic solution. And if you think of a kid that's hyperactive, do they have more energy or less energy? And you'll probably recall that if a kid is hyperactive, they have more energy. So the word hyper refers to more. The hypertonic solution is the one that has a higher solute concentration. And so notice that in this case, here in white, this is our cell, and our cell is placed in a solution, and that solution has more solutes outside. And so we would say that the solution outside is hypertonic relative to the cell, because again, hyper means more. So this solution is hypertonic relative to the cell. And remember that anywhere that solute is, water is gonna be associated with it. So all these little red dots here are referring to water. And notice that if there's more solutes outside, that means that this outside solution has less free water. Notice that there's only, in this case, one water molecule that's free to move. If we look inside the cell, which has a lower solute concentration, it's gonna have more free water because the solute concentration is lower and there's more water molecules that are free to move. So inside the cell, we have more free water. And so think about it for a minute, which way is the water gonna move? Is it gonna go into the cell or is it gonna go out of the cell? And so think about it. So where is the water gonna go? And if you think about it, it's gonna go from its high concentration inside the cell to the low concentration outside. What you're gonna see is that water is gonna move out of the cell. Now, we're gonna talk about for each of these solutions, what you're gonna see in both an animal cell and in a plant cell. And remember that a difference between plant and animal cells is that plant cells have a rigid cell wall. Animal cells do not. And so this is gonna affect the way that water moves in a plant cell versus an animal cell. So in an animal cell, when the water moves out from a hypertonic solution, so as the water goes out, animal cell is gonna shrivel up. For the plant cell, the water's still gonna go out, but the whole cell is not gonna shrivel up because it has that rigid cell wall. Instead, you're gonna see something called plasmolysis. And what that means is that as the water goes out, the cell membrane is gonna shrink in away from the cell wall. So it's like the membrane kind of collapses in, but the cell wall stays out here. And so in plant cells, this is referred to as plasmolysis. And you're actually gonna visualize this um, in lab this week. Now, let's look at what's gonna happen if you place a cell in a hypotonic solution. And hypo is less. So remember that if hyper is more, hypo is the opposite, it's less. So in this case, it's the solution with a lower solute concentration. So in this case, the, the solution outside is hypotonic relative to the cell because it has a lower solute concentration compared to the cell. And so when we look at water concentration, remember that if we have more solutes inside, less solutes outside, that means that we have more free water outside. And so think about it, which way is the water gonna move if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution? And so if you think about it, water is gonna go from its high concentration in the solution to the low concentration inside the cell. And the water in this case is gonna move into the cell. And the way that I remember that is if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, water is gonna go in, the cell is gonna swell, and it's gonna become a big O. So hype O cell's gonna become a big O, okay? And so water's gonna go in, cell's gonna swell. 
And so that's going to look different if you talk about an animal cell versus a plant cell. In an animal cell, if you put it in a hypotonic solution, the water's going to go in, the cell's going to swell, there's no cell wall to restrain how much water goes in, and the cell's going to lyse and it's going to burst open. Think about for a minute if you've ever been dehydrated and you had to go to the hospital to get an IV. You probably know that if you go to the hospital, they're not going to put pure water into your IV. They're going to put a saline solution. And that's because they don't want to create a hypotonic solution outside your cells so that all the water is going to rush in and your cells are going to burst or lice open. And you can actually die from water intoxication. It's something called hyponatremia. And it happens sometimes in marathon runners when they sweat too much, if they drink just pure water, you create a hypotonic environment outside the cells, too much water goes in, and your cells would start to lice. And so again, this is why in a hospital, if you're dehydrated, they're not gonna put pure water in there. They're gonna put a saline solution that has some solutes so that you don't have too much water rushing into your cell. If you think about a plant cell, however, if you water a plant, you don't use salt water or saline to water your plant. You just use tap water where the solute concentration is low. You are putting your plant in a hypotonic solution. And in a plant cell, that's actually a favorable reaction because as the water goes in, it creates some pressure inside that cell and that makes the cell become turgid. It creates what's called turgor pressure. And that pressure inside the cell from the inside pushing on the cell wall, that pressure is gonna make the cell very rigid, very firm, and that's what allows the plant to stand upright. It needs that turgor pressure. So in a plant, you wanna put the plant cell in a hypotonic solution because you want the water to go in to create that pressure. But again, animal cell, not good to put it in a hypotonic solution because the water is gonna go in, no cell wall to restrain it, and the water is gonna cause the cell to go pop and burst open, that's called lysis. Now, back to the slide about tonicity, and I said about um, always make sure to pay attention to which solution you're paying it, or which solution you're talking about. So notice in this case, we can say that the solution, the solution is hypotonic, but the cell we could also call hypertonic. So we could say that the cell is hypertonic relative to the solution, right? It has more solutes relative to the solution. So again, always be careful when you're using the terms hypertonic and hypotonic, which one are you referring to? Are you talking about the solution or are you talking about inside the cell? And so in this scenario, the solution is hypotonic relative to the cell, or you could say the cell is hypertonic relative to the solution. And the last scenario is if you put a cell in an isotonic solution. Iso refers to same. And this is where you have an equal solute concentration on both sides of the membrane. So notice one, two, three, one, two, three, solute concentration is the same, which means that the water concentration is also the same. Notice one, two free water molecules, one, two. And so what that means is you have an equal concentration of water on either side of the membrane. And so think about that for a minute. Does that mean that the water won't move? And if you think about it, right, you might recall that molecules always move even at equilibrium. And so it's not that you don't get any movement. You just don't get net movement. Water is going to go into the cell and out of the cell at the same rate. And so the water is equally going to move in both directions. So if you put an animal cell in an isotonic solution, 
Water is going to go in and out at the same rate. That's going to be a normal animal cell. Again, you want your cells to be in an isotonic solution. For a plant cell, however, that's not a good thing. Again, you want that pressure inside the cell in order to make the cell firm so that the plant stands up. If you were to water your plant with an isotonic solution where the water is going into and out of the cell, the cell is going to be flaccid. And if it's flaccid, it's not firm and your plant's going to wilt. And so best scenario for an animal cell, isotonic solution, best scenario for a plant cell would be to actually put it in a hypotonic solution so that the water goes in. And so I have a class paper for you. So if you're stranded on an island, should you drink the ocean water to quench your thirst? Why or why not? So when you're ready, go ahead and pause this and think about your answer and write down what you would have answered had you been in class. And then when you're ready, go ahead and turn the video back on and listen to the answer. So go ahead, pause it. Okay, so let's go over the answer. So if you're stranded on an island, should you drink the ocean water? The answer is no, because if you drink the ocean water, which is salt water, right? Think about what happens. If you drink ocean water, you're creating a hypertonic solution outside your cells, which means there's more free water in your cells and the water is gonna go out of the cells and that's gonna cause your cells actually to become more dehydrated. And so if this continued to happen, this would lead to dehydration and in extreme cases, death, okay? And so you would not wanna drink pure ocean water because again, drinking salt water would cause you to become more dehydrated.